Now, keep in mind, if a Roman Catholic were hearing Binder's summary, they'd probably want to push back and say, oh, come on, like that. <laughs> that's not completely fair. And if, certainly if a Lutheran were hearing this summary, they would say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't push us into that corner. But, but Binder says, well, this is kind of a helpful way to distinguish at least a little bit between these traditions. I'm stuck here. All right, hi, Ben. There, thanks. For Anabaptism, Binder said, the vision of what it means to be Christian is a process of transformation of life through discipleship. So that's by way of background. We can say more about that, but we're not going to. What is the church within this model, within these models of Christian faith? How do we understand the church itself? Well, Bender proposes that for Catholics, the church is often seen as an institution. And it's not hard to see how you might make that case when you look at the papacy in Rome and the archbishops and the bishops and the priests and the robes and the ceremonies and the structure and everything comes from the Pope down and from the teaching office. And it's very, very, very organized and has been in development now for a couple of thousand years. And certainly in comparison to many other churches, you'd have to say the Catholic church has this pretty strong institutional component compared to say, you know, the Bible church down the road or OMC for that matter. Like we got some structure, but it doesn't really look very big or sophisticated or complicated if you put it alongside Roman Catholic structure. <clears throat> for Lutherans, the church, Bender suggests, is the instrument of God for the proclamation of the divine word. And, and Luther's, or Bender's not just completely making this up. It was Luther himself who said, the, church of, the true church of Jesus Christ exists wherever the word of God is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered. So what do you need to have a church in the Lutheran tradition as Luther himself proposed it? You need to have somebody preaching right and make sure you're celebrating the Lord's Supper right. And if you do those two things, you've got the church. Now, again, for Lutherans, that's not the end of the story, but that's a pretty significant point of departure in relation to definition. For pietists, a group that emerges in the early 18th century among German uh, Christians, um, read the history if you're interested, it's not exactly Reformation, it's not Anabaptist, but it's a very significant um, sort of spiritual movement in, in the early 18th century, pietists reacted a little, they, they actually came out of the Lutheran tradition and they were reacting to what they saw 150 years after the Reformation as a kind of Lutheran, um, maybe sterility, the spirituality was like, listen to the sermons, take the sacraments, and it's all good. And the pietists, Right, a movement of people that said, no, no, we're all supposed to be growing personally in our individual lives as Christians. It's not enough just to say, yep, I'm saved by grace through faith, praise God. No, that's where you start. <clears throat> but then you go on to grow. But, says Bender, for pietists, the church was primarily kind of a resource group to help individuals grow in their spiritual life. Now, again, if you could go back to Halle, Germany, East Germany, and talk to the pietists, they might say, well, that's not completely right. But Bender's making his point, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, Bender says, for Anabaptists, in contrast somewhat to all three of those other models, the church is a brotherhood of love in which the fullness of the Christian life ideal is to be expressed. The church is not a thing that just helps me grow spiritually. It's not a place where I go to hear sermons and have the sacraments. 
it's the context for the living of the Christian life. It's the place where kind of our Christian life is supposed to unfold. It was intended that it be a, he calls it a brotherhood of love in which the fullness of the Christian life is to be expressed. <clears throat> but let's be honest, brotherhood <laughs> is perhaps not the best label for the 21st century. So it worked okay in 1943 and for centuries before that, but it's probably not the best choice today. So what are we gonna talk about instead? Because it has a long history, this notion of the brotherhood. So I went to Webster to see what my options were. <laughs> Webster offers 63 synonyms for the word brotherhood. And many of them were simply like, well, that's not even close. A few of the more promising ones, association, club, fellowship, fraternity, which is problematic also as is fellowship. <laughs> League, organization, society, collective, sounds a little too USSR <laughs> communist maybe. <laughs> like commune, a little too 60s hippie, like community, cooperative. Well, that's where you buy organic Right. <laughs> Alliance, that sounds a little political partnership. That's what business people do. Body, maybe. Circle, I don't know. Clan, that just sounds too much insider outsider ish. Click, that's even worse. That's what you have in junior high. <laughs> Band, um, core, way too military. <laughs> So for our reflections this morning, I'm gonna use community because I think it's a reasonable choice. But even community, it's not a perfect equivalent because we use community often just to mean our neighborhood. Like other the part of the community by which we mean they live not far from here. Well, that's, that's not really the sense that we mean when we talk about Christian community. But in the end, what I think is that what label we use isn't nearly as important as the vision that we're trying to sort of express when we talk about this thing that is at the heart of what it means to be Christians together. The New Testament, it turns out, uses a variety of metaphors to remind us that we're not on this journey alone. It was about oh, a half a century ago, I believe it was Paul Tournier, the Swiss psychologist, who said there are two things that it is impossible to do alone. One is to be married, <laughs> and the second is to be a Christian. Now, you can think about whether you agree with that or not. Um, his point was simply, being a Christian was never understood in the New Testament as something you just kind of decide to be. Being a Christian is a way of being in relation to other people. Turnier argued, maybe in an analogous way to when we say being married is a way of being specifically in relation to another person. And you can't really do it by yourself. And the New Testament certainly uses metaphors that point us that direction. Paul says we can think of this group that we're part of as a body. 1 Corinthians 12 develops this at length. You can study that if you're interested in exploring that one. It's like a human body that has eyes and ears and hands and feet. And if everybody was an eye, then what would you hear with? Paul says, and if everybody was an ear, well, then how would you see? Like, no, we have all these different parts in the body. And he goes on to say, and you are 
the body of Christ as believers collectively, not you personally. You personally are not the body of Christ. You are a component, a member of the body of Christ. Ephesians 2 uses the notion of family in which we relate to each other as spiritual brothers and sisters. Even those labels, when we talk about being brothers and sisters in Christ, we say that because we are children of God, which is also a very uh, a strong theme, especially in John, both in the Gospels and in his letters. Of course, King James Version is beloved. Now you are sons of God. So we're back to that kind of inclusion labeling thing again. But it's clear that we're talking about membership in a, in a family as brothers and sisters. Peter develops this idea of Christians being he says, you are like living stones being built together in a structure where God lives. That's one that maybe we don't use, we don't think about as often this idea. We might say, yes, I'm a child of God. We're less likely to say, yes, I'm a living stone. <laughs> but that's a biblical metaphor that Peter says. It's, it's kind of like there's this building. There's this temple where God lives, and it's made up of stones that are alive. And what are the stones? It's believers. In that same passage, he goes on to say, as living stones, you comprise, and here he switches metaphors completely, you're a royal priesthood comprised of people belonging to God who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. These rich metaphors that suggest our collective identity as believers, not our sort of lonely individualistic status as a happy recipient of the grace of God that has saved us and will take us to heaven. No, it's collective. We're part of something here, now. Romans 12, one of several passages that talks about the gifts in the church and how God has gifted us differently. First Corinthians 12 also describes this. We have these different gifts but all of them are intended to be used for the blessing of everyone. And we're really different. We know that instinctively, and then sometimes we're reminded of it sort of shockingly in a jarring way when we, in an interaction with somebody, we say, like, how is that even possible that you think that <laughs> or that your mind works like that, or that that would be your first impulse of what to do next. Like, how is that even possible? We have these little jolting reminders that we're really different. And the New Testament develops that theme in the context of gifts. Yes, we are really different. And some of that difference has to do with the way God has gifted us. We're not made to do exactly the same things or to bring exactly the same strengths. To what? To this collective thing that we're part of. So what is a community? What does it look like in the New Testament? Probably the classic text and one of the earliest descriptions of what Christian community looked like is this one that we find in Acts 2, just after the Holy Spirit has been poured out in this dramatic day of Pentecost event. And toward the end of chapter 2, we get this description of a summary. So how did it all work out? Holy Spirit was poured out, tongues of fire, mighty rushing wind, tongues, people amazed at this demonstration of God's bringing something new into being. And the summary at the end of the chapter says, 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Koinonia is a Greek word that is kind of an important one here that we could talk about more, but we won't. Um, it's a word that's been used often as it's like if you're trying to capture what exactly are we talking about here and you can't find quite right the right English word, well, you can always go back to Greek and say, well, actually, what like the Greek says it better, koinonia. <laughs> and we're like, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so, like, if you've ever studied another language, you know how difficult it is, how impossible actually it is, finally, to translate exactly one word into another word. We end up kind of talking around and explaining and saying, well, this is kind of the same, but not exactly. And koinonia is one of those words that will show up from time to time. They devoted themselves to fellowship, which is one good translation of koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is a really powerful description of life together, of life being shared, of life wrapped up not in my interests, but in the interests of a community. And for that reason, it's often been the text that sort of groups go back to when we're looking for kind of the original inspiration. What is Christian community supposed to look like? Well, look at Acts 2. And then the question immediately becomes, so like is this the ideal for every Christian community? And specifically this part about, seems like pretty close to the elimination of private property. Like nobody actually had anything that they called their own. Everybody just sold their stuff and Gave it all away. This is not an easy question to know how to answer because it does seem clear that this is being presented as a kind of powerful model of what happens when the Holy Spirit fills a group of people. So you could say, you might be inclined to say, and therefore, this is really the goal for every Christian group everywhere, always. The problem with that is that even by not very long later in the New Testament epistles, you have Paul telling the Thessalonians, look, I want everybody to settle down, get a job, provide for yourself, so that you won't be a burden on anybody. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound like the elimination of private property. That's more like, listen, people, don't be a freeloader on the system. This isn't supposed to be a place where everybody just sort of lives off of everybody else's resources until they all run out, and then what? I guess everybody quietly slinks back to work. <laughs> Paul, even by the end of the New Testament, is providing a model for Christian community that doesn't sound like Acts 2. It sounds dramatically different. <clears throat> and yet, this vision of how it might be possible to live so it keeps coming back and inspiring new groups of people from time to time to say, well, what if we actually lived like that? One of the groups that, even in the Anabaptist vision, this thing that, that Harold Bender wrote, we heard the other week about the Hutterites, this group of people that coming out of the Anabaptist movement really kind of zeroed in on this passage, eliminated private property, 
and live communally and have been, there are groups of Hutterites that have been living communally ever since. Most of them today are out not real far from where Tanya and Susan live in Montana and the Dakotas and the provinces of Canada, basically places where there's prairies and lots of space and nobody bothers you. That seems to be the attraction there and where you can buy really big tractors and grow a lot of wheat. <laughs> so it's a model that even that, that from the 1500s right down to the present, there's at least that little group of people that is, has they've embraced that as God's best. Well, they're kind of a pretty unusual in the, in the Christian church. But as I said, this keeps coming back. When Don and I were in our late 20s, we lived in Chicago for two years. While I was in graduate school, Don was working as a social worker, and we were privileged to attend this little church down in Evanston, just not far from the campus of Northwestern University called Reba Place Fellowship. Reba Place had begun in the early 60s by a group of young college grads that were captivated by this vision of community and they moved into Chicago, into Evanston to form a Christian community, which came to be known as Reba Place. And it was a dramatic experiment in communal living. They really did, for members of their group, abolish private property. When Dawn and I attended, we were invited to, to participate with what was called a communal small group on kind of a visiting basis. Like the church had developed a lot since then. And by the time we got there, there were actually two tracks in the church. You could join the church communally, which was the original vision, or you could join the church congregationally, which looked more like kind of a regular church. And so there are these two tracks. We were part of a communal small group, but we were not members. Um, it was a fascinating thing to watch. If you joined Reba Place as a communal member, you turned over all of your assets to the church, all of your bank accounts, all of your inheritance money, anything that you had became property of the church. And people in the, on the communal side of the church, most of them had jobs. They had income. All of their income went into the church bank account. The church used all of that money collectively to buy apartment buildings, houses, and then provided housing for communal church members. They live rent-free in property owned by the church. The church owned a fleet of cars. If you wanted to travel somewhere and you were a communal member, you could check out a car and drive it. It wasn't yours. You didn't have to maintain it. And it was a vision that was really um, kind of compelling. What people got as kind of personal spending money was a monthly stipend that was based on a sort of um, public assistance allowance, sort of a welfare allowance. And so everybody had that for kind of their personal incidentals, like you didn't have to get church permission to buy shampoo or toothpaste. You had like your own money that you could use for that. So we were in a small group um, with a guy who was probably 30, 35 years old. He had a job as a computer programmer. He was single. Um, this was, you know, back when, I don't know, computers were relatively new. Um, so he was like at the cutting edge of high tech. And I don't even know what he made, but probably more than I've ever made since. <laughs> And he turned all of that salary over to the church. And in exchange, he got like a welfare allowance. But you wanna talk about a place to belong? You wanna talk about a group of people that had a very, very strong sense of belonging to each other? It was powerful. 
we met every week. We usually ate together. We'd have kind of a small group meeting, Bible study, prayer. We celebrated birthdays together. We went outings, picnics together. It was a powerful um, way to be a Christian in relation to other people. We actually debated. I remember it's like, well, you know, this is, we can do that, but we're not sure we want to. And we ended up not joining communally. We ended up not staying in Chicago. And actually, when we began attending that small group, we were pretty sure we weren't going to, but it, it seemed like a really special opportunity to kind of share life with a, a dozen people. There were various communal small groups, we were part of one of them, and kind of see this up close. It was powerful and it was attractive. And it gave structure and meaning and all sorts of uh, opportunities. This church had an amazing impact in their community in reaching out to the poor, to immigrants, deeply involved in racial reconciliation and integration because they had resources and vision to do it. This is what the church is supposed to be. And we've got money to work with because we've got all these incomes coming in from professional people, many of them. And they're living on welfare allowances. So there was money to work with. All of that to say, this vision has not ever kind of gone away as a motivating, inspiring snapshot of what it might look like to live like that. Postscript. Um, it's a difficult way to live, even for the people in the communal small groups. And they had lots of challenges, and it hasn't always been real, real smooth since we left. And I don't even, we haven't been there now for a few years, so I don't even know the latest. But, um, it's not an easy model to maintain. As families grow, as second generations come along, as people want provide things for their children, but have to ask the church whether they can buy them. It gets really, really, really complicated. Galatians 6 is one other passage that I want us to think about just a little bit. <clears throat> that gives us, I propose, a, kind of a different vision of what community means. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The church's community, the Christian body as community, among other things, means that we carry each other's burdens. When somebody's hurting, we do what we can to help. When someone's suffering, we try to support them as best we're able. If anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test his own actions, and then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now, wait a minute. How can Paul say those things back to back? We're supposed to carry each other's burdens and carry your own load, people. <laughs> Don't be a slacker, freeloader. <laughs> Don't expect too much of everybody else. And that dual theme, I think, is, runs constantly through the New Testament. Yes, Christian community is designed to be a place of amazing identity, support, belonging, encouragement, and occasionally rebuke and restoration when it's needed. Why? Because we care about each other. We don't want to see people just sort of quietly slip off the rails and end up in a ditch. We do what we can to restore people 
But along with that, there's a sense in which we have our own responsibilities. Let us not become weary in doing good, Paul says, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Again, there's this interesting tension, I think, between wanting to, wanting to recognize on the one hand that the gospel is fundamentally a gospel of inclusion, of everybody together, everybody welcome, this language of insider outsider, you know, we don't want that to be part of our stance in relation to the world. It's not us and them. And yet, there is a difference between us and them. If there's not, well, then Christian community doesn't have meaning. It does have meaning. It's designed to be a place where people experience welcome and care and inclusion, but it's also a place where we recognize that it's different. And maybe even our obligations are different to people inside the family of believers than they are to people outside the family of believers. Think about that. I mean, I don't know how that how that should be sorted out in every situation. But both of those themes, I think, are part of the New Testament record. <clears throat> what builds community? How do we work at this? Well, the themes that were developed in Acts 2, hospitality, together in each other's homes, eating together, sharing meals. They got together for prayer. They shared resources in Acts 2. Gathering. New Testament says elsewhere, don't give up meeting together because that's really important. Don't give up gathering to encourage each other. Why? Because we're not Christians by ourselves. We're Christians as part of the body. Supporting, caring. This Galatians passage talks about carrying each other's burdens. Encouraging each other. If someone's falling away, gently help them come back. Support. And when you think about this and talk about it in a bit in smaller groups, what would you put on the list? What are the things that help to nurture and build community? Okay, so since for some of you, Nothing anyone says will carry as much weight as something that Tim Keller says. <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought it'd be appropriate to end with a little Tim Keller quote here. Um, Tim Keller was approached a few years ago after, it looks like after a church service, and somebody says, so what are the things that you find encouraging and discouraging about millennials? This was asked him by a millennial. And this is verbatim. Tim Keller's response. You can look up the video clip or ask me and I'll send it to you if you'd like to see him say it. Because of course he says it better too. <laughs> um, Keller says, on the one hand, I've never seen a generation more interested in community, more desirous of it. As soon as I do a series of talks on community or sermons on community, everybody's there. If you put community into any headline, everybody thinks that's great. There's a real understanding that community is important and relationships are important. On the other hand, the younger generation doesn't want to make the sacrifices that enable community to happen, which means you have to limit your options. You can't just travel everywhere. You can't just move every two years. You can't just live any way you want. It means, for example, instead of staying with the friends you have through social media, it means learning to know the people who live geographically and physically near you. So many of the commitments and sacrifices you've got to make in order to be part of a community and the curtailments of the freedom that goes with that, young people don't want. So they want community, 
and yet they're not willing to pay the price. I think that's both the best and the worst about your generation, he says to this millennial question. I'm also a Tim Keller fan, by the way, just to be clear. And I think that really captures the dilemma that in a sense, we all live with. We live with it in the church. People live with it outside the church. If you look at sort of the broader culture and rates of say cohabitation versus marriage, what's that about? People want the benefits of marriage, but they don't want any of the limits of marriage and so on and so on and so on. Apply this to the church. Same thing's true. I loved the power of our Reba Place small group. But man, it came with a high price. Now, this doesn't answer the question of, so what does the ideal community look like? And if you look around, if you frame the world as you know it, in this, in the context of Keller's statement, it's really an interesting thing to reflect on. I mean, think about the old order Amish community. Anybody who's grown up Amish, and I did not, they can talk about the power of that identity. And it's not just, it's not spiritual necessarily, it's just human, human connection, place to belong helping each other. Your barn burns down and you got a hundred guys the next week building a new one. Like, who does that? Well, the Amish turns out. <laughs> it's a powerful vision of community. And it comes at a very high price. A price that many, many people who grow up in the Amish community say, I don't want to pay this. And to be fair, it also comes with some really ugly Sort of pieces of the underbelly. That's also, uh, that's part of the risk, I think, of commitment of connection. It's not coincidental that families are both the place of some of our greatest joys and blessings and satisfactions. And when they get screwed up, the context of some of human beings' deepest pains and hurts and rejections. Why? Because they've got great potential. But when they don't work, it's a disaster. So part of this trade-off, you got to commit if you want to be part of community. If you want to build community, you have to limit your options. So what do you want? What are you willing to pay for? And let me just say this about OMC. I think if you put sort of the churches of North America on a spectrum, OMC is pretty far toward the really strong community side of that spectrum. Why? Well, partly because we're small, partly because there's a lot of you, sadly, I can't say us because I live out of the prairie, but <laughs> many of you live close enough to just be kind of interwoven in the fabric of each other's lives. That's what builds community. That's one of the things that builds community. So I think OMC has got a lot going for it on the community front. <clears throat> the question is, are there things we could do better? Are there ways that we can nurture and strengthen Christian community? So here's some questions, which I'll leave you with. When and where in your life have you experienced community most strongly? When and where have you felt like this is such a rich experience of being part of a Christian community? What decisions have you made or have I made to make community a priority in your life? What are OMC's strengths <laughs> in relation to community? I mentioned a couple of them that I'd like you to think about that. Next, Nita. 
how might OMC, how might we strengthen our community life? And do you think that Tim Keller is right when he says, everybody, everybody wants community, but most of us aren't sure we want to pay the price. Do you think that's true or not? Do you think it's true for you? Why or why not? So I'm deeply grateful for the privilege of having sort of walked sometimes up close, sometimes at a distance with OMC as it formed and has developed. And I think Christian community is at the heart of much of our vision of life together as followers of Jesus. What does it look like going forward? How could we strengthen it? How do we experience it, both its strengths and its failures? Parenthesis, talking about community in 2020 is a nightmare for anybody. Like, how do you be a community when you're supposed to be isolating yourself at home? So we look forward to the time when that won't be part of the equation, but it has been. Think about these and share with each other your reflections on those questions and on these themes. Thanks. So you guys can form groups. We'll put the Zoom crowd in their own groups as well, but yeah, circle up and have some discussion. I want to circle up. <laughs> <laughs>